Created in 2005 and hosted by security industry veterans, Paul Security Weekly is your source for in-depth coverage of the latest vulnerabilities, exploits, and security research. Our weekly security news discussion dives deep into the security issues we face today and potential solutions in a fun and lively atmosphere. Each week, we bring on guests from the security community to learn about their journey and discuss topics relevant to their work and research. You can also subscribe to our show by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe or look for Paul Security Weekly in your favorite podcast catcher. We've recorded a ton of content over the years, so we created Spotify playlists featuring some of our favorite episodes, including interviews with Marcus Random, John McAfee, and Chris Roberts, to name a few. You can find them at securityweekly.com forward slash starter packs. Hello, everyone. I'm Bill Brenner from Cyber Risk Alliance and Security Weekly. We are back, continuing our live coverage of InfoSec World. And I'm here with Ward Cobbley, Product Line Manager at Viavi. If you want to know more about Viavi, by the way, go check out securityweekly.com slash Viavi, I-S-W, and um, learn more about them. Welcome. Thank you, Bill. So, um, I want to start by giving people a picture of who Viavi is and what we do, because everything I ask you from there will give people that broader context. So, I like it. So talk about, talk about the company. Sure. Uh, well, this is a, a big year for us. 2023, we're actually celebrating a 100-year milestone. Uh, Viavi started off in 1923 with Wandel and Golterman. So 100 years of delivering intuitive instruments, intelligence, and insights. That's my alliteration for the day. I'm very pleased that I've remembered it. <laughs> but we, if, when I describe Viavi, I often think about um, delivering solutions from the ground up. So fiber certification, uh, delivering instrument, instrumentation that helps me manage my data center, uh, the devices in my data center, the services that are hosted in my data center. Uh, if we move a little bit higher up, uh, terra firma still, we've got uh, 3D sensors for consumer electronics, spatial sensors for cars. As I move up, I've got 5G and 6G networks, and if we want to go up next, there's visibility into the cloud, and we even have technology that has made uh, space missions successful. So it's kind of a fun way to look at it from an altitude perspective, but uh, it's a big year for us and we're, we're happy to have reached this milestone, so thanks for asking. And you have a talk coming up. I do? Do you? No, I don't. <laughs> so talk about, um, I've talked to so many people, most of the people that I've interviewed so yeah. far, uh, they want to talk about a talk they're I'd giving. be happy if you can find me a room in an audience. <laughs> <laughs> Hook me up. Well, it's next year. <laughs> uh, but uh, t just talk about, um, and then I have some more specific questions, okay. but talk about for Viavi as you're walking around InfoSec world and you're thinking about the things that matter to Viavi customers. Yeah. Um, what is that for you? So, so today in this setting, we're going to be very focused on things obviously related to uh, security and threat, right? Because for this audience, that's what 99% of them care about. Some of them may have overlapping responsibilities that go into other adjacent areas, but here we want to kind of help them understand how we can help in the areas of threat forensics, for instance, uh, how we can take a high fidelity set of data and allow them to use that to their advantage when it comes to identifying suspicious traffic, when it comes to understanding a breach in progress, when it comes to reducing dwell time, when it comes to documenting the effects of a breach. Uh, and we also want to talk to them a bit about exposure management, which is kind of a new area for us. And we've been spending a lot of focus on this show, uh, talking about the, expo uh, the importance of threat exposure management. Very good. And. Um so, we, j we just talked about your milestone. Um, let's move on there though, um, and just for transparency with the audience, I'm using my iPad here because that's where I scribble my notes. <laughs> and so if you see me looking down, that's why. So, um, Viavi is seeing a re-emergence in the demand for packet and flow data in the cloud. Right. So, 
based on your experience, why would you say that is? I think I would point to three things. I would look at uh, performance, proof, and security. And if I could, I'll talk for just a moment about each of those three. And, and it hasn't changed, it. thank you. It hasn't changed since the early days. You know, what's old is new again. Whatever cliche you like, nothing new under the sun. We've always needed visibility into performance and packets were always a wonderful way of getting there. Uh, they helped me understand how a network infrastructure is behaving. They helped me understand how services are being delivered. They are uh, a great source of proof when there are problems. If I know this is a vendor problem, they let me hold the vendor's feet to the fire. You know, you, the, the uh, expression we've heard, packets or it didn't happen. If I can show the vendor the packets, then they know they have to own that problem. And then when it comes to security, as I've mentioned, packets can serve an awful lot of purposes, uh, both proactive use as well as kind of after the fact, documenting the damage. All those things were true before the cloud, all those things are true in the cloud. The challenge is accessing that information is different. You get that information differently in a data center than you do in a completely virtualized environment or in a, in, you know, a public cloud setting. And then there's kind of the, the cousin of packets, which is Flow. Flow's been around since the, the late 90s. It's a great technology for understanding conversations, patterns of traffic, you know, who's communicating to whom, and again, that is essential visibility to have in these fluid, dynamic cloud environments when you need to understand who is talking to whom and whether or not that should be happening. So these data sources have served us well for decades and they continue to be essential in the cloud. Some people are just learning this because they're starting their IT careers in the cloud and they're starting with vendor provided tools and discovering they have some gaps and limitations sometimes. So let's go back to our old friends uh, that always tell the truth and, and always give us the answers. Yep. Now, you made an announcement last week and um, it was related to threat exposure management. So talk about the announcement and the story behind it. Sure, so the announcement was a, a new product for us called Observer Sentry. The Observer product line has been around for a lot of years now but it has been more focused on the performance management side of things. Observer Sentry puts us squarely in threat exposure management. And what got us here is you know, our business unit within the Viavi universe is called Network Performance and Threat Solutions. We've got a lot of experience with performance, but those same data sources we just talked about, primarily packets and flow, can really be put to good use um, in in terms of uh, threat and security. But the thing we were kind of looking for is to take advantage of an emerging uh, need, which is to understand exposures. Uh, one of the leading and, uh, industry analysts has asserted that we need to evolve beyond our traditional methods of threat detection, investigation, and response. And we need to move more towards exposure management. And sort of the three facets that they point to is visibility, accessibility and vulnerability. So first I need visibility into these cloud environments to understand what resources are out there, uh, how these things communicate with one another. Accessibility helps me understand the paths through those environments and into those environments from the outside. And then vulnerability helps me understand where I've got critical issues that I need to address. So when we, we look at exposure management, I, I like a description I read which is it combines the attacker view with the defender view. So if I can bring those two things together and understand them well, that's going to help me secure that network uh, from those people that want to get in. And so what we've got now is a, is a new platform that allows us to connect to AWS resources, leverage openly available APIs, to get security group information, access control lists, firewall rules, uh, gateway information, traffic gateway information. Pull that all together into a graph model so I can understand not just the inventory of assets that I have in that environment, but how they communicate and also the paths through that environment. Now I've got that internal perspective. We marry that with external attack service management, which now gives me kind of that attacker perspective what are the ways that someone from the outside could get into and through this environment? And then that last piece, vulnerability, says, if I've got an exposed resource, 
I've got something in that cloud environment, there's a path from the internet, and it's got a known vulnerability, that's a toxic combination. I need to prioritize that highly because someone can get to that device and it's got a vulnerability, I got to bump that to the top of the list. And so we've provided a solution that gives us all of that. Now for those who want to come and talk to you about the solution, um, where's the best place to find you this week at InfoSec World? This week, booth 923, right around the corner from where we're sitting right now. <laughs> Beyond that, our website uh, is a great place to go. We've just started publishing content. The press releases went out last week. So viavisolutions.com slash PTV, and you'll see Observer Sentry kind of front and center there because it's our, our newest thing. It's going to get top billing for a while. <laughs> Fantastic. So, That'll wrap this segment, um, but Ward, thank you for coming on. My pleasure, Bill, thank Great you. Great to talk to you and catch up. And again, folks, if you want to learn more about Viavi, please visit securityweekly.com slash Viavi ISW, as in InfoSec world. Thank you. We will be back. Hi there, and welcome to InfoSec World 2023 in Orlando, Florida. I'm Bradley Barth with the Cyber Risk Alliance and Security Weekly, and my guest with me here today is Ruben Moretz. He is head of security at Delete Me. Uh, Ruben, thanks so much for joining us today. Sure, good uh, let's jump right into things. Why okay. might an organization need a service like Delete Me? Well, your people that you have in your organization are the entry point to all the services and applications you use. So they're an extension of your firewall. So it would make sense to be able to be able to help and reduce the risk associated with those, you know, that threat endpoint and improve the security for the your employees um, as part of that, you know, um, of, of your risk and vulnerability management program. So. Yeah, well, because it's a funny thing because, you know, you, you, you talk about all of these uh, instances where an employee might be uh, fished or socially engineered by someone via email, let's right. say, but uh, sometimes it doesn't even take uh, the, the employee to, to give away information uh, directly to the malicious actor. Sometimes they're doing a good job themselves uh, giving uh, potential threat actors um, fodder that they can use for social engineering attacks just from putting their own information online or in the course of just you know doing business uh, data is collected on them through a series mm -hmm. of companies that they interact with online through through uh, data brokers right. and so sometimes you don't even need to maybe have direct contact with an employee you can a, a bad actor can find information pretty easily uh, online is that not correct yeah that's that's where we come in I think that the, the lines have been blurred since 2020, really, with a hybrid work environment of working from home, to where you can't, you don't just go to office and leave your private life, privacy information at home anymore. It's a collective of, yeah. of, of the employee. And you don't necessarily know what's out there. So uh, a threat actor can use freely available information uh, on the internet to create a profile of an individual. Right. And it's like, when you can create a profile of an individual to understand them, um, that's a huge risk to an organization and also to the individual. Um, so being able to you know, have some quantifiable way to reduce that threat, to be able to reduce the exposure of that PI information that's available to those threat actors on the internet, yeah, uh, and also from a consumer standpoint, just to reduce the amount of, of uh, spam and, and 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 spam calls in, that are like really annoying, um, uh, from a consumer standpoint, uh, is important. But in the end, it's understanding what's out there, right? right? And and Delete Me helps do that. It helps mitigate that risk and it helps the individual, and also um, uh, CISOs and, and security teams understand what risks are out there that pose that. Um, a, a, a vector for attack for you know, into your organization. So. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, just diving into that a little bit further. Explain uh, why security teams uh, should care about their employees' personal information. We've already started hinting at it a little bit that it, it can be used. 
uh, in a number of uh, nefarious ways. Let, let's get into some more specific examples. Well, <clears throat> well, uh, if I if if I may, you know, it, you don't have to go far on the to find breach information on uh, national news, right? Yeah. Um, and a lot of the, uh, you know, e even lately this year, <clears throat> there have been some very prominent breaches of organizations, and, and I'll use, for example, in February, Activision in particular. Uh, Activision had a hack that exposed uh, data with, for their personnel, um, uh, 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 salary information, home address information, um, based off a SMS, a targeted SMS phishing attempt against one of their HR employees. Yeah. So, if, if you ask the, the, the CISO or someone in that organization or even the individual, hey, you know, would you be interested in mitigating the amount of personal data available out there, including your phone number and things that could target you for that? Would you do that? I mean, after the fact, obviously, I think the answer is yes. But the point is to be able to get in front of it and to mitigate it. Um, because it's not, the, it's, it's a large piece, it's a giant puzzle. Yeah. And each piece of that puzzle contains a little bit of data. And what, organ and what data brokers have done over time through collecting this information with the inability or the lack of action to be able to reduce that exposure is to create this large aggregated data risk, like, like very deep data analysis that you don't even know is happening. Mm -hmm. right? So yeah. it's important to understand not just individual pieces of information, but how those are collected into a whole yeah. to create like a larger risk for the organization. So Yeah, and even just as a quick follow-up, I mean, you gave me a great example with Activision. Yeah. Even if you look more recently, uh, with the hack of the uh, the MGM resorts in Vegas. That mm. was something where uh, you had threat actors who basically were looking up information about employees through, in this particular case, LinkedIn, but it doesn't necessarily have to be social media. It can be anywhere that you can find information on employee that you can use to more convincingly impersonate an employee so that then you can pose as that particular person and then perhaps fish an organization or go after maybe an executive or somebody who controls money or something by Perhaps you're impersonating a, a CEO or a CFO mm -hmm. uh, and tricking somebody into maybe doing a financial transfer or something. So there's lots of things that you could potentially do with the information that the data brokers uh, make available for each individual person online, right? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's when, you, when you look at the, the, the big picture, yeah. and again, I'll go back to that, the, the sort of, uh, like, the, the marriage of, being in privacy, being at home, being in the workplace, yeah. it's all, all of that information can be collected together. So LinkedIn is a great example. LinkedIn is a collection, they have a collection of like business information that's available to the public. You just yeah. have to have an account to log in and view very basic information and, and some individuals provide a lot of information as part of their jobs to, you know. Yeah. And, and that's understandable. But to the extension of that, the personal details of that person's life is out there on the internet somewhere. There's, yeah. there's, there's, there's a large amount of PI data associated with that. So sure. you can't just paint a picture of the person as a business professional anymore. You paint that picture of, of the total life of that person. Yeah. And that is, it, it's, 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 a, it's a risk I take seriously, our organization takes seriously, and, that's, and, and, and we uh, uh, want to reduce that threat yeah. landscape for those individuals and for companies that want to not only protect their employees as a valued service, um, but to reduce the, the threat landscape for that to be a potential way to, to have a data exfiltration, hack into yeah. their company and, you know, because we all, we don't, that's, that's our, uh, you know, that's what's valuable to us, that's what you want to protect. Your intellectual yeah. property and your, uh, your data, right? Yeah, that's, absolutely. Uh, Ruben, you know, you mentioned privacy, so uh, let's uh, look at privacy from a CISO's perspective for a few minutes. Sure. Uh, how does privacy protection benefit the CISO specifically? Oh, well, it's, it's, threat, it's threat and vulnerability management for your people. Because we, we look at threat and vulnerability management across infrastructure, but don't really think about it, how we do it for your people, and it typically comes directed as an inflow through human resources, right? You do security awareness training. And that hum security awareness training is typically used to, to, to quantify results for reducing risk to your organization for understanding phishing, smishing, or SMS uh, um, uh, uh, phishing attempts. So the extension of that is 
how do we manage that? How do we reduce that that threat, right? Other than just doing training. I mean, you have tools that you look for phishing attempts, but again, going to the home, everybody has a cell phone. They're, they're working from their cell phone. They get phishing attempts and, and you deploy tools to do that. Yeah. But again, going back to collection of information, like the more, the more information someone has on you to create a threat profile, then you can be targeted, right? So I like to see it, the way I view it is, we all understand what a CVE is, right? We understand the importance of, of, of keeping track of CVEs and patching on a regular basis based off, based off of the, the risk associated with that CVE. What if we could apply a CVE to our people? Would you not want to patch that CVE, right? You know, the current way you don't really patch it, you sort of mitigate it a little bit, there's no way to patch it. So we see it as a way, the service is a way to patch the people CVE, you know, so yeah. that's kind of to, to put it in perspective in, in, in terms of how we how we approach it and how you can look at it from from a CISO like management perspective, why you would need it. I feel yeah. like that's a good, you know. Yeah, oh, I like the way you put that. That's, <laughs> a, that's a good way of looking yeah. at it. Uh, you know, as the head of security for Delete Me, have you seen a reduction in social engineering attacks uh, with the uh, with the with the Delete Me service? Oh, certainly. Um, I, you know, as 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 most, uh, uh, you know, I've I've been in cybersecurity for over 20 years now, right? And and building cybersecurity programs for, in particular, for for startups. And one thing you see you see results from mostly from either your tools, so you have to monitor to them, um, which is, a, is is an aggregation of, of your training. So you want to see like a very high success rate in the amount of like phishing, um, uh, uh, phishing uh, testing that you do for your, your employees or SMS phishing um, for your, through your security awareness training. Um, but you also kind of look at individual reports because you know it's like, hey, if you see, see something, say something, right? I, this was a phishing attempt. I got a text from our CEO saying he needed something, a gift card, <laughs> you know. And uh, um, and being able, you have the tools to be able to see the results of, oh well, you know, we had this, you know, a, a certain number of like phishing or SMS phishing attempts reported. We had this number that is was blocked from, you know, our, our, our appliances and security tools that we have in place. But you start to see uh, a, a reduction of that uh, over time as yeah. as more members of your organization. The the I, I think it's the, the the longer that you have it there, and the longer um, um, that the the service like removes data, that footprint off the internet, you start to see a reduction. And I can certainly see it just from my standpoint of, of working with other organizations over yeah. time. The amount of volume based off of our employees, like the number of employees and the volume of, of those types of attacks that come in, is yeah. significantly reduced uh, at Leamy. So, so I feel you know very confident in in that that it's it is we have a quantifiable way to show this making a difference, and yeah, it gives me confidence there. We have uh, just under uh, three minutes, uh, maybe with that remaining time, uh, just for those who uh, maybe still need to be a little bit sold on the idea sure. of, uh, you know, why do I necessarily want some of the information that's publicly out there and available on me on the web? Why do I need to uh, maybe see if I can uh, have that uh, removed or, or controlled in some manner? Can you just paint a picture as to, in, in some capacity, uh, just how much information on any one particular uh, individual or employee may be out there, or, or maybe another way to look at it would be, what might be some of the more uh, surprising or concerning pieces of, uh, like data points on a particular employee that might be available out there that you might be like, oh, you know, I didn't really think about that, that, that that's out there and somebody could use that information against me. Well, um, well, your name, email addresses, aliases, and phone numbers, home addresses, um, places you shop, marketing efforts, um, all these are could be collected from individual data brokers, right? Yeah. Eventually, over time, they get shared to create like a picture of, of who this person is and what they're doing, where they're shopping, where they're traveling, geolocation data, um, 
they maybe use a maybe use a, a like a throwaway email account mm -hmm. so that you're not recognized, right? Or like another phone number, and you think, oh, this is a sneaky way to hide it. They're not going to be able to tie this into who I am. Yep. You aggregate that, and you see that number associated with an alias email address, like a work email address, right? It, or or another your primary address you use for like security for banking accounts, like things that you use, and then it becomes like a lot different it's, it's a lot different to look at the scope of that and how that can be used to paint a picture of, of or to profile the individual for a targeted phishing attack so yeah. um but until you see it you, you, like we have this idea that we understand what could be out there right and it's like you don't know what it's, it's like you don't know it but you should know it right, right. it's part of like gaining and that's a, one of our core principles and our missions right is to, to allow the individual to get control of their privacy and their personal information that's on the internet and then when you see that like when you see that amount of information that's out there piece by piece that has hey they know where i shop they know they can tie my alias email addresses with yeah. my primary phone number with my spouse's phone number right um email accounts associated with um like schools and organizations that you may be involved with yeah. right all of those are, are, are important um, um, to understand and to be able to see them allows you to take action and that's i think that's where we you know fill that gap absolutely right. well put all right well we're going to leave it there ruben <laughs> uh thanks very much uh ruben sure. moretz uh, head of security at delete me uh for those that would like to learn more about delete me uh, please visit uh, backslash delete me uh, ISW. Uh, so at w from uh, the uh, the InfoSec World uh, website. So infosecworld.com slash delete me ISW. Uh, all right. Well, thanks very much. Thanks Thank for you. joining us, and for everybody else that's watching. Uh, please uh, stay tuned for more live and on-demand con uh, content from uh, InfoSec World in Florida. Good morning, everyone. Here we are. It is day one of InfoSec World. Delighted to be here. And I am also delighted to be joined with, by Trace Woodbury. He is the CEO and co-founder of Ridge IT Cyber. Welcome. Thank you. And um, we're going to talk about zero trust. Most overused marketing term in the past 200 years. Yeah, and I think we're going to spend the next 10 minutes kind of breaking that apart. So, let us begin. So, um, we have done, we, Cyber Risk Alliance, have done a lot of survey-based research around how companies are doing implementing zero trust. Challenge number one is organizations are going to vendors looking to see if they are a zero trust vendor. And I know you have some strong thoughts on this. Um, there still seems to be that disconnect of seeing zero trust as a philosophy with a set of pillars as opposed to a product that you just pull out of the box. So talk about that. Well, Forrester came out in 2009 with the Zero Trust ideology white paper that came out. And while I love Forrester, it sat behind a paywall. And customers really didn't have access to it unless you belonged to Forrester. So we had all of these vendors that did have access and said, oh, well, I am Zero Trust. I am this piece. And so every consumer out there, business, you know, et cetera, looking at it said, oh, well, I've bought Zero Trust. I bought this product. I'm, I'm all set now. And that's not what Zero Trust is. Zero Trust is an evolving thought process continuously. Things that existed a year ago didn't exist five years ago. And what's going to happen in two years doesn't exist today. You know, we're seeing solutions that can really get extremely granular in a way we never imagined, but in a way that a small business can afford or a commercial work versus only large enterprise. Uh, and how we can build that and say, hey, what can we work together? Um, I think that being able to say, hey, I'm not buying one product, but I'm looking at a multitude of products and how do I envision this coming together, and, but not so many products as what existed for you know, 10 years ago. I've got 90 solutions and I can't make sense of it all. So the breach has been here for six months. Like how do I get that faster reaction time? 
Um, I almost think in a way it was a disservice that Zero Trust came about because it sounds great when you really know what you're talking about, but it's so hard to implement when you're listening to vendors all the time versus having someone that says, all right, let's talk about your org, let's talk about your goals, let's talk about the types of data you have, because no two organizations are alike, so not every one vendor can fit in. Um, God bless Microsoft, there's a lot of great they do, but if you listen to Microsoft, because they do so many things, well, this is all you need, but there's still shortfalls, not all their products are amazing. Um, and I think in a lot of ways it leaves uh, the businesses more struggling to figure out what's that next piece and how does it come together. So, let's paint a picture. Uh, you are a CISO, a busy CISO. You have been dipping your toe in the zero trust waters. Now you're really trying to take the program to the next level. And there is no one size fits all vendor as you've just pointed out. Talk about today the steps, the things that a CISO needs to be thinking about when they're plotting what they need to buy, how they need to deploy it properly, how they need to optimize it properly, where all the pieces fit together, but also how to get started with what they already have. Well, there's many questions that you asked there. I'm going to do my best to remember I do remember apologize, them. it's a loaded I, I, question. I mean, I feel like there should be a whiteboard of like knock these off in order. Um, yep. So I think <laughs> the first step as you pointed out is, do you analyze each of your tools and say, what can I make with good here? Do you take the approach of, I should be prepared to scrub everything and start over? You know, where does that exist? That could be very painful, but also might have benefits to both sides. Um, but I really think the first step is actually the CISO working with the CEO and the COO and saying, here's what we're going to do, and our goal is actually to make the user experience better and not worse, but I need your buy-in to be able to tell the org, I'm going to do the same things everyone else is. I'm not going to be the one that says, yeah, but I get an exemption. We're all going to go forward on it. Um, I'm not saying that Ridge IT has zero trust perfectly done for us and all those things, but every one of our devices has the same controls that we expect, and you go to use a different device and it doesn't do anything. You can't get anywhere because you don't meet minimum guidelines to how we've been able to go through, and we're still working through all that. But if our CEO wasn't on board of, you know, wherever the source, we have problems. When we work with customers throughout the world to do deployments of different tools, when we have the CEO that's sending the emails out saying, we are doing this, I need you to work with us, not have different subgroups saying we're fighting this because, or I don't want this. One is streamlined and goes so much faster. The other one is a two year process of maybe it'll get implemented, maybe it won't. And those CISOs are the ones that are going crazy. You didn't actually hire me to do a job, you hired me to say we're trying something. And so I think that's actually the first step is go make that presentation that says, I'll, be, I'll let you be involved, I want you to be involved but how do we go forward on that? I think the next piece is the tools that existed five, 10 years ago have a chance of still being the right tools today, but a lot of those tools have come out with new features that need to be reevaluated and say, do I have all the right things or did I buy the tool set from 10 years ago? I just kept hitting renew on the invoice and I haven't actually implemented it properly. It's now out of date. One of my customers was a very early, early adopter into Zscaler seven years ago. Well, they're using Zscaler functionality from seven years ago, not Zscaler functionality of today. So it's a beautiful logo that you can tell everyone we use Zscaler, but realistically, there's a whole bunch of blind spots that now exist. So just saying, do I have the tool? Maybe it needs a refresh on the tool that you have to say, hey, it's still the right thing. And Zscaler's done amazing stuff. Um, another friend that I work with is in vulnerability management, and they use McAfee. McAfee can be a great tool, but it also is one of those things, how do you properly get that implemented? How does it work? What does it need? And maybe your org has changed in a way that you need a whole new refresh of certain areas that you're doing. Um, I also think is a CISO pick something, don't try and do every tool all at one time, like we're going to flip a switch from zero trust. Pick something that's of importance to you in that one pillar area and start there. In my opinion, identity access management should be that first thing you start on. But for each org, maybe it's something else. Hey, my IAM product's okay now. Let's go work in this other area. We'll come back and deep up IAM later. But starting with that thought process of, I can slowly make the user experience better, but I can slowly shrink that perimeter of what can get in and how do things leave. I think the data pillar is the most overlooked pillar out there. 
because people don't have any clue where their data actually resides. They do these reports and come back and say, oh, I, I know where my data is, and you pick and say, well, BYOD devices, how, what data can be downloaded, what can exist there, and hey, if I use some of the cloud assessment tools now that are third party, just use an API, to what degree do you have S3 buckets sitting out there? To what degree do you have other things you didn't even know about? Hey, I didn't realize the server had RDP fully exposed. So people don't really understand that thought process. They're not stepping back and saying, vulnerabilities aren't just CVEs. Vulnerabilities are what is my total attack surface. Yeah. So long-winded response, I think I nailed no, this you, what you, you asked. Did, you did a great job unpacking a very loaded question. So, well done. So, um, one of the things that when we survey security professionals comes up is the challenge of asset management. And there are some who would say that asset management within the realm of zero trust is maybe not broken, but not as fully baked as it should be. Um, what are your thoughts on that? So I've, in the government space, easy to pick on because I can lay out their regulations, they must identify all the devices that are in their org and where are those devices and what do they look like. Well, if I'm only concerned about devices and not data, I'm missing the picture because technically any device with my data is what's accurate. Um, when you work in a closed network, well, it's really simple. I know that something can't join because it's not you know, approved to be in here, but so many environments are saying, hey, here's the bits and pieces that I've allowed for that access, but it still can be everywhere. So as we take about thought, think about true zero trust, I don't trust any device. But wait a second, the CEO's phone is now holding that. That's not part of asset management. I don't know what CVEs or what other things exist on there. When I think about what CrowdStrike's doing is now exists, well, if I don't have CrowdStrike on every device, I'm, even though that's giving me a zero trust score, what's the point of it? If I look at solutions like Okta together and CrowdStrike, I can now say, hey, I'm looking to see is CrowdStrike on the device and a minimum Z Z T zero trust score, which you know we won't get into why they're overusing the term, but now I'm actually doing real asset management. And now I'm actually saying, give me an inventory of all these things that do touch my data and what can happen. As I look towards isolated browsers that say, all right, fine, I've stopped caring about the whole device. I'm only going to use this isolated browser session. Well, that gives me a better context than saying, I have 500 devices, 10,000 devices. Yeah, you have millions of devices if everything can get access to it, you know. That's my opinion, at least. Yeah. So, talk about um, there's zero trust as it currently is. There is zero trust of the future, which I have to believe is something that you spend a lot of your waking hours thinking about. Someone asked me. Paint a picture of that future. Someone asked me earlier today, you know, where do you see your company in five years? And I said, I don't like answering that question because the things existed five years ago, no one thought they were going to happen, much less what's now coming out there. And so I think the same thing is what I struggle with on zero trust of the future is we won't start keeping the idea of employee or corporate owned devices. We'll start thinking of ways that every device could be just in time provision, like Improvada's doing and others. We'll start thinking of how do I truly maintain my data posture and what's going on. Uh, there's other pieces that'll sort of crack things apart. I was talking to a group the other day, uh, AirGap, that when you're on the corporate network, everything is a slash 32. Nothing naturally talks to anything else, similar to how a cellular network works. Now, AirGap's been around for a minute, but this idea that I just show up and I can start talking to other things starts disappearing. You know, how do I close that off. There's so many bright minds that are saying, how do I take all these next pieces? Um, I was talking to a group that, you know, in the DSPM space, and they're truly tackling the ability to say, let me scan your file shares, your SQL databases that are on-prem, not forget about those, plus what's in your cloud assets, but they don't hold any of the data. You're using basically a lambda, fu lambda function to be able to do all of that in the VM. They're only holding pieces of metadata to say, yes, this was a real piece of what we found, and here are all the people that have access to the sensitive data. So I think that what's going to change in how we see the world will start more on that data piece, but we'll also keep in context of all the users and devices that data piece can talk to. 
Um, because right now we've spent too much time on ZTNA, we've spent too much time in those other areas. How do we get back to what's most important, that's the data. Yep. So talk about how your organization is trying to help get other organizations to that point. So Ridge has been around 10 years, the other founder and I have been working together for over 20 years, and we started out in the government space. And we worked with an org that said, hey, we want to get rid of having tons of point solutions, we want to simplify the ecosystem, we want to be able to make it almost SaaS or managed services based for everything. And I thought she was crazy when she asked us to do this. Um, and we really said, all right, we can actually evaluate the needs for compliance and the needs for security and say, hey, this is possible now. And five years ago, I really didn't see it. But today, Ridge really understands all the products they represent and we're able to truly offer those services, not just say, hey, I can fast paper, maybe the vendor can do it. So if you buy CrowdStrike or Microsoft from us or uh, Qualys even, we truly can do all of the tier two, tier three support that's needed, and we're not here to close a ticket, we're here to understand the bigger picture. So as we sit down with our customers and say, hey, what are you trying to accomplish? What is the reason you're buying this? Not what does the PDF say that you want this? What is the actual end goal? Because everybody's got something different. How do we meet that? Some people are going after CMMC compliance, not necessarily zero trust. Some people are going on other pieces. Our goal is say, right, how do we work together? And that work together thought process means when a customer says, hey, I'm battling this problem, sometimes we quickly realize the issue that you're having isn't related to Zscaler, it's actually related over here to Okta or Microsoft, but one of the senior engineers can get together, collaborate with the customer and say, here's how we come together on solving that solution. And I think the other big thing that we look towards is, is so many people out there saying they do cloud-based services, but they're really just taking their on-premise networking knowledge and they're going to put that in the cloud. Well, that's not how cloud was designed. You're missing out the functions. There's some great Dilbert cartoons that I absolutely love on this matter and Dilbert nailed it. Um, but when we say, all right, let's actually look at a cloud first approach and let's look for where these services can matter, there's cost savings that can be achieved versus these huge compliance, but we can also say, hey, I can do things that scale faster and do better. Um, and there's a reason that cloud is winning faster at the zero trust game than the appliance architecture, in my opinion, that exists. I was working with a group the other day that's truly an MSSP that works in a very technical space, but they're having to outsource to us to say, hey, how do we actually make things better and faster? How do we use resources to get into there? Um, so we are out of time. I could keep talking about this for like, another hour. Or 10 days. This is great, yeah, no. Um, but this has been very helpful. I think our audience will um, take some valuable lessons. So thanks for being here, Trace. Thank you so much for your time, Bill. And um, yeah, have a good week. You too, sir. Stop by our booth. I surely will. Thanks. <laughs>